Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, who really is our rock and our redeemer, who bought us back from sin and death. God, that is what we deserve. God, we are slaves to our sin, slaves to another master, and you rescued us so that we are slaves no longer to our sin, but to you. And God, I pray that you would be with us now as we remember that great and wonderful truth, the awesome power of your death and resurrection to forgive us. Lord, as we come now to your table to remember what you did, God, I pray that we would worship you afresh, that our hearts would be softened, that our joy would be renewed, that our hope would be steadfast and anchored in the truth that we see in your word. So God, be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. And as we come to share the bread and juice in memory of our Lord's death, please open your Bibles to John chapter 19. And if you do not have a Bible this morning, a couple men are going to come with Bibles, and you can just raise your hand from where you're seated, and they'll hand you one. And if you don't own a Bible, you can keep this one as a gift. John chapter 19. Each week, we remember the death of Jesus, our rescuer, our redeemer. We remember him by eating a cracker and drinking some juice together. This small meal is for those of us who trust Jesus' sacrifice as the only way to be saved from God, the only way to have peace with God, and the only way to be deeply loved by God as his children. Jesus' death on the cross is the only way, and we remember that. We don't eat and drink in order to be rescued by God. We don't take communion as a means to that end, but rather we do it in order to remember what has already been accomplished that we have already been rescued by the death of Jesus, God's son. And we don't just remember, but we also proclaim. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, when Paul is writing about communion, he writes, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior this morning, then as you eat this meager meal, that we call the Lord's Supper, do you realize that you are actually proclaiming a historical event that occurred 2,000 years ago? And this event provided you with a rescue from your sin and a reunion with God, a reunification with the God that you have been estranged from, the God that you have rebelled against. This time of eating together is a proclamation that we are trusting in the death of Jesus. And there are many, many things to say about the death of Jesus. Thousands of them that you can find in scripture. This morning, we're going to look at one in John 19. We're going to look at the very last minute, perhaps the last seconds of Jesus before his death. And in these final moments, in these final breaths, we're going to watch Jesus carefully, consciously, deliberately, with absolute knowledge, absolute power, finish all that God required to save his people. Jesus has absolute power, absolute knowledge, and he is hanging on a cross. I mean, what a contradiction. How does someone with absolute power and absolute knowledge hang on a cross and die in this way. He's doing it for a very specific reason. Read with me. John chapter 19. Uh, verses 28 to 30. After this. Jesus knowing all. Was now finished. Said to fulfill the scripture. I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
Think for a moment of all the things that needed to be accomplished for Christ to fulfill all that Old Testament scripture that foretold of his death, his life and his death. There are so many prophecies in scripture. If even one of those prophecies proved false was not fulfilled, then either God is a liar or Jesus is not the Messiah. Think of all that Jesus had to fulfill to complete his charge from the father, all that his father wanted him to say, all that his father wanted him to do. Jesus finished what God required of the savior. He finished it. He has absolute knowledge, absolute power, and like a checklist, he could go through every single thing that was required to save sinners. And he did so perfectly. In John chapter 19, just before our passage, there's a scene where several things happen simultaneously. One is that Jesus is hanging, pinned with nails to a cross with a sign over his head. And that sign has the right charge written over it. Pilate wrote that sign, but not because he wanted to write the right charge, but because he had a power struggle with the religious leaders. And so he wrote, King of the Jews, even though they wanted him to say, just that he said he was king of the Jews. Pilate said, no, I'm not going to write that. Pilate did that to provoke the Jewish leaders, but God had ordained that that sign read true. The Jews had indeed rejected and killed their king, as the scriptures said they would. And then, of course, there's the guards at the foot of the cross. They're gambling over Jesus's clothing. In verse 24 of John 19, scripture points out that they did this because Psalm 22, 18 said they would. Unlike Jesus, they were not intentionally trying to fulfill the scriptures. They just were. I mean, that is the power that we're dealing with. God, Jesus, the Messiah, is accomplishing everything. And while the soldiers are doing that, Jesus is caring for his mother. And then after that, we get our passage. After this, after those things, Jesus, knowing all that was was now finished, said, I thirst. And Jesus never lied. He was thirsty, undoubtedly thirsty for water after hours of bleeding under a hot sun, undoubtedly thirsty for fellowship with the God of life who had turned his back on him as Jesus spent hours under the hot wrath of God. Jesus was thirsty. But if we ask the question, why did Jesus say, I thirst? Why did he say that? The answer comes back from the hand of John, from the mouth of God, to fulfill the scriptures. Even in excruciating agony, Jesus did not lose sight of what was required of him. Even as he suffered, even as he hung there, he knew what he needed to do. He said, I thirst. He knows the scriptures and he is going to obey And fulfill every last one. And having wet his mouth with that sour vinegar. He says. It's finished. And again. Jesus never lies. It is really finished. It's finished. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember as you take communion this morning. That it is finished. Jesus did everything that is required. To save ruined sinners. He did everything that God's holiness, God's perfection, God's righteousness requires. He did everything that a good physician must do to awaken dead sinners to life. He did everything a good shepherd must do to bring us to God. It is finished. It's accomplished. And when all this was done, Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That's what it says. He laid his life down. No one took his life from him. Just nine chapters earlier, John quotes Jesus in John chapter 10, when Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down in my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. God sent his only son to die in the place of his enemies and Jesus obeyed. He finished the work his father had sent him to do. So anyone who trusts in Jesus now might not perish, but live forever. 
That is the death that we remember and proclaim this morning. So if you would admit this morning that you are not trusting in Jesus' death, if you're not trusting in Jesus' death in your place, then just let the communion tray pass. Let the cracker, the juice go by. That proclamation is not for you. I mean, don't be a liar. Don't lie and proclaim the Lord's death when it's not what you're trusting in. Instead, find someone here who trusts the Lord Jesus and talk to them what this crucifixion, this death, and this life, this resurrection life actually means and what it can mean for you. Find someone and talk to them this morning. Find me, find an elder, find a friend who loves Jesus. If Jesus is your only hope for life with him when he comes again, then join your fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord as we remember that Jesus had all the knowledge and all the authority and all the power to die the death he needed to in order to save wicked and mortal people like us. So men, would you come and serve us this morning?